This is the human side of healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. And welcome to the human side of healthcare. Thomas, it's great to be with you. And you know what? I've got some good news. I know. And you know, for a couple of weeks, we haven't had very good news. Things are turning around and looking more positive. May I ask, what is it? Well, here it is. I was talking to my counterpart from San Francisco, and he told me he had just had a virtual meeting with some Stanford physicians. So I listened to what he said, and then I did a little research on the internet. Here's the good news. In the Southern Hemisphere, especially around Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, guess what they're seeing this year, Thomas? A decrease in influenza. Wow. And the reason... The reason is twofold. First, it appears the flu shot that they decided to use is really working well against the influenza virus. However, the really good news, all of the things such as wearing a mask, physical distancing, washing your hands, good personal hygiene, is also stopping the spread of influenza. So the silver lining from COVID-19 precautions is, guess what? It works against the flu also. And not to bring up an obvious point, but it's wintertime down there. We kind of forget that in August in Dallas, don't we? It's hot here. But they're dealing with what we're going to be dealing with in just a few months. So the question is, can that be applied here? We certainly hope so. I hope it's the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, that when it comes here and we get cooler weather, people are inside. If they continue to do the things that was stressing they do, it's going to hold down COVID-19, we hope, and also it's going to hold down influenza. That is amazing news. You know, we've been interviewing Dr. Trish Pearl. She's chief of infectious disease at UT Southwestern Medical Center, professor, obviously. Interestingly, she reiterates exactly the same message. So let's just put this together. You've heard it fresh this week from South America, from a group of Stanford doctors. You've been preaching this message for six months now, basically. And here it is again from Dr. Trish Pearl. Even though we are seeing a slight decrease in the number of cases, the number of cases we're seeing now is fourfold above what we were seeing a month and a half ago. The new baseline is huge, and it's really put a lot of pressure on the healthcare systems, not only caring for the COVID patients, but not caring for people who have non-COVID-related illnesses and need care. So this new normal is not acceptable. And even if we are seeing cases go down, they need to go down further. And they need to keep on going down to as low as we can get them. And this is one for um, not only the healthcare system, but actually for safely opening the economy. And as we move and keep on, um, well, as we pivoted, shall we say, to looking at measures that individuals can control, which are those three W's, wear your mask, watch your distance, and wash your hands, we've been able to show that we can actually really do a lot more work and open our economy safely. So what we're trying to do with all of this is safely allow people to get back to a different normal. And I think it's important people understand that this new normal is going to be different. It's going to involve social distancing or physical distancing wearing masks, and a lot of hand hygiene. And honestly, a lot of this is going to protect them from other viruses also. But, you know, I think it's really important that people understand that even though this downward trend is uh, very, very, very important 
and it's required a lot of hard work, we have a long way to go. And, you know, we have to think of this as a marathon, not as a sprint. You know, she's exactly right. It is a marathon, not a sprint. Thomas, we have got to tap down this baseline of COVID-19. We've got to continue to wear our masks, physical distance, hand washing, because we want to stop influenza as well. So if we do this, we can have a positive impact throughout the fall, especially in North Texas. Boy, this news that you're giving us today out of South America is just super encouraging. Now, one of the places where people are gathering every day and soon will be gathering every day, of course, work, and then coming up in just a couple of weeks, school in North Texas. Fortunately, classes will be virtual for at least the first few weeks. And Dr. Pearl has some thoughts on how we can keep the workplace safe as people come back from vacations, we get school headed back in that direction. How can we do all of this safely? Other things to think about is you do not want to be going to work sick. Uh, And so when you are feeling sick, that's the time to stay home. And certainly if COVID is prevalent or flu is prevalent, you want to get tested for some of those viruses that are transmissible. Uh, And the reason to get tested for both is if you have flu, then we would treat you for flu and we wouldn't necessarily treat you for COVID. So we really want to differentiate those kinds of things. But we don't want people going to work when they're sick. It's important they stay home. And then, you know, for schools, schools, there's a lot that's changing right now in terms of what can we and can't we do in school. So I'm going to tell people to watch very carefully for local guidance in terms of what people should and shouldn't be doing. Specifically, though, I will say that, again, really reinforcing hand hygiene, staying home when you're sick are going to be really key to keeping these schools safe, and then also uh, reinforcing some of the um, practices around not sharing food, trying to eat in environments that are going to be safer. All of that is going to keep your school Mm. safer, and they may actually have some restrictions in terms of what kinds of -of out-of-school activities can and can't be done And again, I'd sort of ask people to heed the advice of the experts in those recommendations that come out. Good advice on the schools, Thomas. And, you know, we're going to have to really look at this as we reset it and hope that things go quite well. You know, speaking of school, don't you have a very young granddaughter that was born in February of this year? Already starting the college fund, yes. And she was born right before COVID exploded in March, but she was six weeks premature. Wow. So she was in there during everything that hospitals have been dealing with relative to COVID. And we have a special guest coming up next. Marjorie Quint Buzid from Parkland Health and Hospital System is going to tell us what they have been doing to implement new safety protocols and take care of moms and babies and families during COVID-19. That's next on the Human Side of Healthcare on 1080 KRLD and radio.com. This is the Human Side of Healthcare on 1080 KRLD and the radio.com app, where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. And welcome to the Human Side of Healthcare, Steve Love, along with Thomas Miller. Welcome to the show. We're delighted that you're here with us this afternoon. You know, we're going to talk about a very important subject, pregnancy and childbirth during the pandemic. COVID-19 has certainly impacted all of our lives, but can you imagine if you're pregnant or if you're delivering a baby during this time? We decided to go to a real expert, and we're delighted that we've got with us today Marjorie Quint Buzid, who is a MBA RN, Senior Vice President of Nursing, and she works in the Women's and Infant Specialty Health at Parkland Health and Hospital System. Marjorie, welcome to the show. Thank you. My pleasure. 
Let's talk a little bit about some of the changes maybe Parkland uh, has made at their hospital during COVID-19 to keep mothers, infants, and family members safe during labor and delivery. Can you expand on that? So what we faced at Parkland is really a challenge and uh, to just rethink how we do care. At Parkland in our uh, women's infant specialty health, we pride ourselves on being a family-centered care provider. And so we are always thinking about families because, quite frankly, a lot of our staff or employees here at Parkland are mothers and they are actually experiencing the same challenges not just being a healthcare professional but also being pregnant during this pandemic so we take a very holistic approach we look at things such as how do we need to um, bring people in for face-to-face visits when we bring them in for face-to-face visits is there are there some we've actually put some things in place where we screen them we have a healthcare provider call after about symptomology um, before they actually even enter our campus that allows us to then prepare for them for when they have to come because the pregnancy doesn't go away um, so while we were able to tell others to socially distance and don't go outside and um, you know we also have to think that people are still pregnant they still require health care they still have to come to doctors visit and so we want to make sure that we have a way of uh, screening them uh, for symptoms prior to them coming in and if they are positive and they do still need to come to the hospital that we'll know beforehand and that we'll be prepared to meet them. We also had to think about basically when uh, COVID-19 started, we had no really, no real idea about the impact on the fetus, the baby that was growing inside mom. So we had to do a lot of internal meetings and pre-planning and looking at external guidelines from the CDC and other scientific organizations about how do we prepare for this baby that's going to be born and make sure the baby is safe, particularly if mom is COVID positive. Part of what we've done is we had to take a real critical look at our visitation policy. Um, How do we screen people, visitors to come into the hospital to make sure not only that we're keeping mom and baby safe, but that we're keeping our staff safe and then other visitors. So it's been a whirlwind of changes. All of it really still trying to um, keep the pregnancy safe, keep mom safe, and keep our employees uh, working with those individuals safe. You know, Marjorie, labor and birth is such an exciting process for the family. COVID-19, what has this done to the visitation policies at your hospital? So that was important to us, and we we had several iterations of our visitation policy. Uh, the short answer is yes. During the labor process, a birth and process, labor and birth process, we do allow a support person to be with mom. To one, uh, you know, she still does need psychological support, emotional support, physical support. That sometimes even a healthcare worker, even as well intentioned as we are cannot provide and so we do allow a support person in the delivery room as well as just to, to visit with the mom and the newborn as long as they're not COVID positive. Obviously if mom is COVID positive we do limit visitation after delivery. Uh, if they're mildly, mildly symptomatic we do allow a, a visitor uh, and if they're actually full-blown COVID positive with respiratory conditions. Mom generally is very sick at that point and we do not, we allow, our team here has been very creative and we do Zoom visitation and that has worked very well. If the baby happens to need the services of our neonatal intensive care unit, we do allow two parents or caregivers to visit the baby. So let me ask you this, and I'm going to drill down a little bit. Have you actually at Parkland had any mothers that were COVID-19 positive deliver babies? Yes. Uh, so our mothers are representative of our community. So <laughs> generally, it's it's natural that we did know that we would expect moms would come in positive. We um, we were initially we started out only testing women who were coming um, with symptoms. 
We then followed the science and realized our colleagues nationwide were actually experiencing some positivity in women who did not have symptoms. So part of us trying to be proactive, we actually initially at some at one point started testing every pregnant woman who was admitted for delivery. We had to since suspend that because of availability of testing supplies. And and then we've actually got supplies in, and so now we are still testing. So if you're coming in for a scheduled cesarean section, which is, you know, a surgical delivery, or if you're admitted in labor, we actually do uh, a full testing of all of those women. To date, we've had about... Um, I think approximately for the, the current latest available data I have, we've had 137 women who are tested positive during the pregnancy at some point. About 78 of them have delivered, and I think we've only had four infants who sus- subsequently tested positive at the second time. So we test the baby twice based on CDC recommendations. So let me ask you this then. For any babies that did test positive for COVID-19, how are they cared for? In a separate unit, or what do you do with a COVID-19 positive infant? Because there's so little known uh, in the scientific community at this point, because this is a new this is a new phenomena for us worldwide, and so we're very careful with our newborns. And so we actually, if a mom is positive. We isolate the the newborn and uh, care for the newborn. Um, we do mother baby care here, where the baby would normally be in a mom's room with mom. If mom is positive, because we're still learning how this disease um, passes from mother to infant, we actually put the baby if there are no asymptomatic, we put the baby in an incubator and allow mom to continue to room in with the baby. But we do teach her some guidelines about, you know, uh, keeping the baby, um, not breathing directly down on the baby. We do encourage still breastfeeding. That's important to us. But if the mom is positive, we actually, the baby is placed in our intensive care unit and in an isolation area that we've created. And we make sure, because we also don't want to expose other family members who are visiting or other individuals in the nursing staff to a positive baby at this point. We all know that prenatal care is so important when you're going to have a baby. How has COVID-19 changed your approach to prenatal care? So that is, uh, if I may say, it's been probably our biggest, most significant challenge and change to the current way we provide prenatal care. One of the things that we realized very very quickly we had to do in supporting um, social distancing and people not being out in a community, particularly when they're pregnant, we uh, thought that we would be a, it would be a great opportunity to introduce telehealth visits. And so we happen to have knowledge that a vast majority of our patient, while they have smartphones, they don't necessarily have access to high-speed internet and some of the hardware that it's needed for the traditional tele, um, telehealth um, platform. So we devised a mechanism where we actually did audio-only televisits. Subsequent to that, where um, we recently published uh, in the Green Journal of ACOG where it actually did make a difference and there were some learnings to do. So at one point, we were doing about 30 to 45% of the prenatal visit as appropriate were through televisits. We've honed that down and um, based on our internal lessons learned and we're about 20% of our visits now. So at the point where we thought we could start opening our clinics back up and having more people come in, we relaxed some of that. And probably within four weeks, we realized that when the community spread got more um, pervasive, that we've actually just started increasing back the number of televisits we did. You know, I'm sure if you've had a telemedicine visit during these COVID days that you would echo the chorus. Hopefully they are here to stay. This full interview is on our podcast, The Human Side of Healthcare, on all the major podcast players. And Marjorie Quint Buzid from Parkland Health and Hospital System is back, continuing this important topic that, yes, I do have some personal experience with myself. Back after this quick break on The Human Side of Healthcare. 
The DFW Hospital Council, along with our over 90 member hospitals in North Texas, are proud to bring you the human side of healthcare with Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co host Thomas Miller. And welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Marjorie Quint Bouzet of Parkland Health and Hospital System, talking about how COVID 19 has affected pregnancies, deliveries, prenatal, and post delivery care in North Texas beginning with one of the most important elements of this whole process. What happens after you have the baby and it's time to go home? So we do an individualized assessment for each, um, uh, actually all moms who are uh, and families who are being discharged. We give them um, streamlined communication that's been vetted. They're, you know, appropriate for the reading level. Uh, All of the nurses have been educated on how to give that, nurses and providers, so we're all consistently saying the same thing. We give them um, some education around what is coronavirus, and part of it is there's just a lot of myth, urban myth out there about it, so we try to make sure we use the opportunity to give them high-level education on it. We do give them um, verbal and written information on how to protect themselves and others in their home about coronavirus. We talk about um, how to keep yourself clean, how to use a hand sanitizer. And if you don't have that available, because that's real, um, what are some other ways to make sure that they're keeping themselves um, the maintaining hand hygiene? We talk about distancing and how to, how to maintain social distance in, in a home, particularly if the home has more than two people. <laughs> so we we actually, we go over how to address coughs and sneezes, how to clean and disinfect, um, and how to take care of other children in the home. So we think, we'd like to think that we've really used the opportunity to not just high level say, hey, socially distance and wear a mask, but to really help them to be practical, that they can use this advice actually in their current lived situation. We also do give instructions about uh, providers, you know, how when to see a provider, how to get to a provider, what are are appropriate face covering to use. And then if they're breastfeeding, uh, particularly if mom was positive and she has to breastfeed, we do talk about how to keep your baby safe while breastfeeding. You know, that's excellent information. And I have another question, a little unfair, but I, I, I really am curious you know, uh, a few years ago, we had to deal with Zika, and Zika uh, had an impact on pregnant women and the development of a newborn. Have and, and maybe it's too premature, but do you know of any studies that have been done, at least preliminarily, dealing with the possible impact and effect of COVID-19 on newborns or even on pregnant women? So I am not aware of all of the studies. I, I'm aware that even at Parkland, we have a significant amount of IRB level research activity going on, but not aware of anything that's been finalized and published about impact of a COVID positive on the um, on the fetus, right, the unborn baby. What I will tell you is we actually believe that we could potentially have had one of the first infant that was born to a COVID positive mom that showed a vertical transmission, meaning that there was no other sign of any other way the baby could have gotten COVID positive, meaning mom did not have an infection. She was not ruptured for a very long time. And so we believe that this baby actually got the um, COVID virus that crossed the placental barrier. And so that study was published by uh, the neonatologists who work at, uh, for UT Southwestern at Parkland on that. So we're watching that nationwide. And um, we're actually, there was a, one of the study, I think, in China that did demonstrate, uh, I think they had a few vertical transmission, but nothing else published in the United States. So this is still emerging and we certainly are doing our part to make sure we pay attention to it. So we've, we are actually changing some of our procedures, uh, doing uh, testing on the placentas and hopefully we'll know or we'll have something more solid. Providers usually are really wary to, to draw a, a scientific conclusion until they have adequate data and that's wise, but we'll continue to monitor that. Hi, Marjorie. 
I had one question, and that is risks to the babies of COVID. So could you walk us through, let's say, a normal delivery? How risky is COVID to that newborn? And then take us through some of the complications. So let's say a baby was premature or had (laughs) other NICU-type requirements. What does COVID look like in that household? How risky is it? So as far as um, what we know is COVID-19 is a respiratory virus, right? Because it's a respiratory virus, we don't think that once a person have it, they always have it, Uh, which is different from like HIV, uh, which isn't. So uh, once the body, with respiratory viruses, once your body mounts an immune response, then they usually clear the infection and and it's almost like a a cold. So the infection clears out. So the issue is if mom has, um, is COVID positive, it is not based on the fact that we're not seeing very high rates of uh, transmission in utero from mom to baby once, and we would only know that once the baby is delivered this point there is no real scientific knowledge that it's a harm in the pregnancy at this point so obviously one of the things that I, I know there's a current IRB research looking at is is it based on mom's how sick mom is so if she's asymptomatic and COVID positive or mildly she's demonstrated mild syndrome mild symptoms, then likely that she doesn't have it, uh, she's not sick enough to cause any significant harm to the infant versus if she's very, very ill, is that enough of, uh, would that have a different impact on the infant? What we've seen here in Parkland is we've had some very sick moms who were very symptomatic and has delivered and the infant is subsequently negative at delivery, COVID negative. So this, honestly, I, I still believe we have so much more to learn. The positive thing and the good news is we're not necessarily seeing um, the babies being coming out just being really, really ill. As far as a premature infant, any assault on any of their on their respiratory system is never good, right? Because they're born prematurely, their lungs are premature. And so the good news is the the one baby that we've had, we've so far only had four babies who tested positive at 24 and then again at 48 hours. So likely it is that they are COVID positive. The out of the four babies, only one that appeared that the baby was not exposed post delivery and actually was exposed in utero. And that baby was um, actually a term baby and did very well. What we also did notice that there was some slight uh, for the babies born a COVID positive mom, they did experience um, just some slight respiratory symptoms where we had to monitor their their breathing a little bit more, but not had to intervene on any on any significant way. So we are actually trying to study and learn a lot about that. And this question might shift over more to a pediatrician, but after those Mm -hmm. prematures or the NICU babies go home, and then, Mm -hmm. of course, what we're seeing so much across all areas now of the country Mm -hmm. are uh, family spreads. So they go home, they're okay, but grandma and grandpa can't wait to see them and hold them and hug them and love them, and uh Mm uh-oh, what does that look like? So... Which is why um, I said that we emphasize how to maintain safety at home on all of our discharge for our normal newborn discharge as well as our NICU discharge. We go over um, protecting yourself, protecting your baby, how to do, um, how, you know, how to keep that distance, how to um, share family time together, uh, some alternative ways of having grandma, grandpa, love on, get very familiar with Zoom or how to maintain distance. Uh, because there, there's just too much unknown right now, and it's just not worth the wor- risk. For those who have had babies but have not had your excellent advice as they were discharged from your facility, what are some of the, just the quick version, the elevator speech, if you will, of what you tell folks to do at home? 
So hand hygiene, uh, always, always, always use hand sanitizers and uh, uh, as, as much as possible. Do not go out into uh, large gatherings at home. Keep the baby, mom and baby, because whatever mom has, the baby's already been exposed to it. If there are family members in a home that are positive or having symptoms, that they not come into close contact with the infant, that we uh, we actually teach them how to space out. So, you know, two chairs apart if you're sitting in the living room. Um, wearing masks, so we do encourage them to wear a mask. Um, we do provide masks for visitors, uh, for support people and um, patients here at Parkland. And so we tell them to wear their mask. Um, they can wear either a mask that they got from us or one that they bought, but we do still encourage mask wearing. Um, again, part of it is, you know, keeping your face and nose covered, your nose covered, and if also, it's kind of hard to put a, a mask on a baby. The baby won't keep it on. <laughs> I, however, I did see um, it's somewhere overseas where they had the little baby face mask, and we're actually looking at, do we think that's safe? So, you know, obviously as hospitals, we always have to think of other a- implications, but we're looking into even, is that something that's working in other countries where we get little teeny tiny face masks for these babies? Right now, we have not implemented that because we're actually evaluating the safety around that just from a a choking or suffocation standpoint. Thank you, Marjorie, for those great tips and that full-length, uninterrupted interview of Marjorie talking about pregnancy in North Texas under COVID is on our podcast. It's the human side of healthcare. It's on all the major podcast players. Just search it up. We're probably there. When we come back, chances are you know somebody who has epilepsy. We're going to go in-depth on that important topic with Dr. Anita Bonsali coming up next here on the Human Side of Healthcare on 1080 KRLD and radio.com. We're continuing our conversation on how you can empower yourself to have the best health possible in today's ever-changing healthcare environment. This is the human side of healthcare with DFW Hospital Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co host Thomas Miller. And welcome to the human side of healthcare, Steve Love along with Thomas Miller. And today we're going to talk about a subject that many of our listeners may be familiar with, but we're going to go in depth and talk a little bit about epilepsy. We've got Dr. Anita Bonsali with us today. She is a neurosurgeon, Texas Health Harris Methodist Hospital, Fort Worth. So let me first ask you, how is epilepsy in your eyes defined and how does it really affect the body? So I think it's helpful to start with a definition of what is a seizure because that is necessary to understanding what epilepsy is. So seizures are the result of abnormal electrical activity in the brain and This abnormal activity can cause strange sensations in the body, uncontrolled movements, including convulsions, a change in the level of consciousness, or unusual emotional outbursts, or unusual patterns of behavior. They don't always look like someone dramatically passing out, frothing at the mouth, or convulsing. Uh, People can appear to be awake. Seizures can be mimicked by other medical conditions, including heart arrhythmias, syncope, or passing out. Um, and psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. In addition, seizures can also be provoked by high fevers, and this is really common in children, um, or head injury. And in certain drug withdrawal syndromes, those can also cause seizures. So now a diagnosis of epilepsy requires at least two seizures 24 hours apart that are not provoked by any of the things I just said. So epilepsy is a diagnosis that indicates that the brain is susceptible to recurrent unprovoked seizures. When, when we think in terms of epilepsy and we think in terms of the forms of treatment, for our listeners who may not be as familiar with epilepsy and some of the treatment, would you consider some epilepsy is curable or would you say it's predominantly a chronic condition? That is such an interesting question because I think for a long time it's been considered a chronic condition that has had to be managed long term with medications. Sometimes those medications can be very effective in keeping seizures at bay. That's kind of the the best possible outcome that you can get. 
for other patients, um, that's not always the case. And sometimes the best you can do is to try to minimize the frequency or the severity of seizures without being able to eradicate them entirely. From the perspective of a neurosurgeon who specializes in this area, we know from neurology data that about one third of patients have refractory epilepsy, meaning that they have had a trial of two or more medications at appropriate doses for an appropriate length of time, and they still have very poor seizure control. And some of those patients do meet criteria to be evaluated by a neurosurgeon depending on the results of their workup. So that's primarily the population that I work with. Those patients have to be referred by an epileptologist who has done you know, a very thorough workup and has established that they're a reasonable candidate to even discuss surgery. But many of those patients can achieve cure with surgery. So I, to kind of go back to your original question, I think there is a population of people who can achieve cure from epilepsy without needing long-term medications. You know, that's, uh, that's really good to know because I know, as, as you indicated, I'm an old guy. I remember most people diagnosed with epilepsy, say, when I was younger, you thought of it more as a chronic condition. As you look at the general population and as you look at patients that you treat, is there any way to say who would be more at risk for epilepsy? So I think there are a couple of risk factors that we've identified. I will start by saying that, unfortunately, about 70% of patients diagnosed with epilepsy don't always have an underlying cause that can clearly be delineated, which makes it difficult to talk about prognosis or treatment options and things like that. Um, but in terms of the known risk factors, the, the most common ones are head trauma, stroke, brain tumors, and uh, infections of the brain, such as meningitis. Um, other causes can be certain drug or medication effects, genetic syndromes, congenital malformations of the brain, and metabolic disturbances. But that still leaves a really large portion of patients with epilepsy who we unfortunately can't give them a reason for why they have it. If you're an individual, a parent, or maybe a child, and you're really caring for someone that has epilepsy, are there any actions or advice you would say to keep in mind as they support their loved one? So I think if you are the family member of someone who has epilepsy, I think there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One, it's not the kind of condition that's necessarily obvious from the get-go, but it can have really profound effects on how people are able to live their lives. For example, if you have a diagnosis of epilepsy, chances are good that you're not able to drive. If you don't have a sufficient amount of control over your seizures, you can't drive. And if you think about what that means in terms of how that limits people's mobility, how they can take care of things for themselves, I mean, that's a, that's a really big factor. I think the other thing that may or may not be obvious is that, you know, a condition like this where we have these episodes of uncontrolled movements or emotions or loss of consciousness, I think there's a pretty strong psychological component that comes with it, which, you know, I think is after you've met a few patients and they've kind of described what it's like to you, you can understand why that there is a, often a comorbidity of, you know, anxiety or depression that comes with having epilepsy. I think in terms of what, you know, friends or family can provide, I, I think it can be as simple as accompanying them to their doctor's appointments. Not only does it provide a very tangible form of support, it always helps to have another set of ears listening to what the doctor is saying and, and, no, and asking questions that maybe the patient may not have thought to ask. Um, I find that, at least in, you know, in my experience, having another person there who can listen and also obviously cares very deeply for the patient, that can have a pretty large effect on their outcome. You know, as we look at Texas Health Harris Methodist Fort Worth's epilepsy program, diagnostic treatment support, what would you say is really being done to help Tarrant County and beyond? Because we cover North Texas. So I was hired specifically to provide surgical consultation and surgical options to patients with epilepsy who had been through the workup and were thought to be good surgical candidates. I work pretty closely with a team of neurologists, um, neuropsychologists, uh, nurses and support staff, and we 
collectively have created the Texas Health Fort Worth Center for Epilepsy, which is based out of Harris Methodist, that we really are the focal point for a lot of patients with epilepsy who have been either newly diagnosed or who need to have more of a workup to see if there's a better medical option or even a surgical option for the Tarrant County area. What kind of surgeries do you do? So the gold standard and the only option that was available for a really long time was surgical resection. So if you can pinpoint the area of the brain where the seizure originates and it's in a part of the brain that may not be responsible for other critical functions like speech or vision or movement, you can basically cut that part of the brain out. You can disconnect that part of the brain to stop it from being the source of seizures. And depending on where that is in the brain, you can have different different outcomes in the sense of success rates. So for example, the most common type of adult onset epilepsy is something called temporal lobe epilepsy, meaning it the onset takes place in the medial part of the temporal lobe involving structures known as the amygdala and the hippocampus. And so those patients often respond very well to surgical resection as long as the, those parts of the brain can be demonstrated not to control critical functions like language or memory. I would say with surgical resection in those cases, you can achieve 75 to 80% cure, meaning seizure freedom, at least as far out as two years. And that's usually when the data stops getting collected. You know, Thomas, Dr. Bonsali really touched on the human side of healthcare. Isn't it great how these technologies can help make people's lives better? Absolutely. And speaking of better, let's keep our fingers crossed related to what we talked about earlier from the Southern Hemisphere. Yes, some positive numbers that give us hope. You know, this has been fun, Thomas, and I hope everyone will join us next week. We're going to talk about EMS safety and why it's so important to call 911. That's next week here on the Human Side of Healthcare. Be safe.